Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. So as you can see, we're still in a temporary space. So thank you guys so much for bearing with me. We're just a few weeks away from having our studio ready. So I'm very excited about that. And of course, for those of you who've been following me, you know that I talk a lot about intuitive eating, um, but just because of the way and like the speed at which my channel has really been moving, I haven't had a chance to do a deep dive and give you a comprehensive overview of what intuitive eating eating actually is. I'm going to be doing a intuitive eating series where I'll do a deep dive on the 10 principles of intuitive eating. But until then, um, intuitive eating is a mind body framework that was developed by fellow registered dietitians, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rech. So if you guys don't have the intuitive eating book, it is amazing. It will change your life. And I've got a link down below in my description for you guys to check it out. So until then, I want to tackle some of the most common questions that I've gotten on my channel when it comes to intuitive eating on a very top level basis. And before I do, I want to acknowledge that there are really so many better experts when it comes to intuitive eating out there, particularly those who are in larger bodies who have lived experience with weight stigma. I recognize that I have so much privilege to have a voice here on YouTube. However, I really think it's important that we give these people a voice. We listen to their experiences and learn from their knowledge. So I've left in the description below a list of some of my favorite intuitive eating experts and body positive advocates. So definitely check that out. With that said, you guys have all been asking me specifically about intuitive eating. So the responsible thing for me to do, of course, is to answer. So here we go. Top level basis. Will intuitive eating help me lose weight? Intuitive eating is not a weight loss diet. Let's get that clear. This is not the new keto. Um, so really it's dependent on your set point, your current eating patterns, uh, your relationship with food. All of that will determine whether you gain weight, eating intuitively, you lose weight eating intuitively, or your weight just stays the same. Every situation is so different and it really comes down to your current and your past relationship with food, with dieting, with restriction. So the question often really becomes, how will intuitive eating change my restrict and overeat cycle? And ultimately, how is that going to impact my weight? Does intuitive eating mean that I can eat fries and cake and milkshakes all day, air day, and be healthy? No, not necessarily. Intuitive eating, like I said, is a mind-body framework. There's 10 principles that really build upon one another. The first of which is to reject the diet mentality. Once we have stopped the cycle of restriction and binging and the associated guilt and shame that often comes along with it, we can start to learn how to tune into our body's hunger and fullness cues, and we can start to incorporate some gentle nutrition and exercise into the regime. When I say gentle nutrition, I mean honoring our health and taste buds while feeling our best. So for example, a lot of people find when cake is no longer off limits, it starts to kind of lose its allure. It no longer has so much power over us. Meanwhile, once that moral piece is off the table, we start to acknowledge that eating a more balanced meal that has some vegetables, protein, maybe some slow burning carbs in there, actually feels way better physically and emotionally than eating an entire cake. So our blood sugars are more steady, our bowel movements are more regular, we have better concentration, digestion, sleep, stress, etc. So no, intuitive eating is not just promoting us to eat sugar every single day, all day. It's about listening to our body's true needs. And the first step in doing that is to give up dieting. Can you eat intuitively if you are in a larger body or have an eating disorder? I want to first flag that it's not uncommon for a person in a larger body to also be uh, struggling with an eating disorder. You really can't judge a book by its cover. Having said that, this is why it's so important to work with an intuitive eating registered dietitian because everybody's journey is going to look so different. Some people, especially those who are struggling with an eating disorder and who have fallen out of touch with their hunger and fullness cues, may need to work with a registered dietitian on some mechanical eating. So that might be like following a bit of a meal plan or eating every two to three hours. And once they've achieved that weight restoration and they're more in tune with their body's needs, then we can work through and embrace all of the principles of intuitive eating. Having said that, I truly believe that intuitive eating is something that 
anyone can eventually achieve and practice. And even if you are having to work through some mechanical eating at the beginning of your journey, it doesn't preclude you from working through some of the principles of intuitive eating. So for example, even if you were not ready to start honoring your hunger or respecting your fullness, you could begin by rejecting the diet mentality or challenging the food police, for example. Why did you say that obesity is a bad word? The word obesity is everywhere in the medical literature, and yes, it is an official medicalized term. However, there's a lot of reasons why some people find it derogatory and stigmatizing. The origin of the word itself feels insensitive in that it is literally translated to mean to eat oneself fat. Second, pathologizing someone's body shape just perpetuates weight stigma and reduces a person's identity to their body weight. This is why the medical community is moving towards person first language when discussing a person and their illness. So for the same reason, when I was in school to become a dietitian, we were just being taught to no longer use the term diabetic and instead use the words person with diabetes so as not to label somebody as their disease. For those of you guys who have a bit of a tough love approach, you should know that shaming somebody for their weight is actually counterproductive. Evidence actually suggests that people are more likely to engage in healthy behaviors when they're encouraged to achieve a healthy weight rather than be called obese. I am not in a larger body, so as an ally, really my job is to listen. And if people who have experienced this weight stigma um, feel that terms like fat or larger body are less stigmatizing to them, the least I can do as an ally is to just respect that. I feel addicted to food. How can I possibly engage in intuitive eating? I have an entire video about food addiction coming up where I do a really good deep dive, so stay tuned for that. But I wanna first say that I probably often oversimplify the experience of intuitive eating and it probably feels like I'm being super flippant about it for those of you who are feeling so out of touch and far away from this as a reality. But I absolutely empathize with the feeling of being addicted to food. That is real, true, lived experience, and I'm not going to dismiss that. I may come from an orthorexia background, but when I was really in the throes of my eating disorder, my restriction was often coupled with these immense, intense binges, um, often eating large amounts of food that I didn't even like. In line with my experience, however, the evidence suggests that food addiction behaviors are actually only evident in times of restriction. In other words, you feel out of control with food as a result of a history or current experience of restriction and dieting. Dieting causes an unhealthy obsession around food, and this experience can actually be mitigated with intuitive eating. And yes, when you start intuitive eating, you're probably going to find that if you've been restricting certain foods or quantity of foods, you're gonna go overboard and eat these foods in excess. Totally normal. However, this phase is generally pretty short-lived. It really depends on how long you've been dieting or how extreme the restriction has been. So once you start to trust that the foods you love are not going to be followed by abstinence, you can start to eat in a healthier, kind of happier, more balanced way. There is power in permission. I know I'm being brief on this, but I'm going to go into way more detail in my intuitive eating series very soon. If intuitive eating does not result in weight loss, what's the point? Well, I've already mentioned that intuitive eating may cause you to lose weight, may cause you to gain weight, maybe your weight will stay the exact same, all depending on your set point and your eating behaviors and your relationship with food. However, intuitive eating has a ton of really important health benefits that should not be dismissed. Research suggests that intuitive eating may improve cholesterol levels, improve blood pressure, improve blood sugar, better body image, higher self-esteem, improve your metabolism, decrease rates of disordered and emotional eating, decrease stress levels, and increase satisfaction with life. You can experience all of these things and not drop a pound, which is why weight is not always the best indicator of health. One systematic review found that health at every size interventions that focused on intuitive eating, healthy eating behaviors, and physical activity had better health outcomes than restrictive diets that focused only on weight loss. One of the biggest benefits of intuitive eating is that it helps improve your relationship with food. 
When you tune into your body, you start to recognize how certain foods or quantities of food make you feel both emotionally and physically. And you also kind of get more in tune with whatever you like and dislike. This is a long-term process for a lifelong benefit. It is not a quick fix or a fad. Isn't being obese bad for your health? Don't these people need to lose weight? First of all, I know we see a lot of headlines and research linking higher weights to disease. However, it's really important that we distinguish between correlation, which is what that is, and causation, which we can't prove. There is a growing number of studies out there suggesting that healthy behaviors, not body weight alone, is a bigger contributing factor. So for example, a meta-analysis found that including more fruits, veggies, and fiber in your diet reduced the risk of diabetes and improved blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels even when no weight loss occurred. There are also a lot of challenges that people in larger bodies experience that may explain some of these disparities. For one, there's the problem of weight cycling or yo-yo dieting, which is very common among people in larger bodies who are constantly on and off weight loss diets. Research has found that when people lose weight and regain weight and lose weight again, which is what yo-yo dieting or weight cycling is, that process increases the risk of disease. And that whole process is pretty much inevitable just based on what we know about set point theory and weight loss prevention mechanisms that go on in the body. So for example, one study found that larger body women who dieted had high blood pressure, where larger body women who never dieted had normal blood pressure. In other words, it seems that it's the dieting and the associated weight cycling that puts a person at higher risk of health issues like hypertension rather than the static body weight alone. Second, there's the issue of weight stigma. People often think that telling a fat person to lose weight is motivating, but often it actually has the opposite effect. Research suggests that people who experience weight discrimination have twice the physiological stress as people who don't, and that stress is associated with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. Research on weight stigma has also shown that people who have been fat shamed are less likely to engage in behaviors that improve their health because they're less likely to go to the doctors or engage in physical activity and they're more likely to overeat. This is particularly troubling in the medical community as research has suggested that weight bias among doctors has the power to cause binge eating disorder, lower motivation for exercise, increased blood pressure and blood sugar, less trust in our healthcare providers, and a reduced engagement with healthcare services leading to advanced or poorly controlled chronic disease and low quality of life. On the flip side, research suggests that when people are supported and they feel secure and comfortable in their own skin, they're more likely to make healthy behavior choices and put their health first, regardless of the number on the scale. Third, there's also the social determinants of health, which significantly influence the health of populations. So these range between personal, social, economic, environmental factors. I mean, some of the big ones are things like income or social status, uh, education or employment, all of which play major roles in explaining some of these health disparities. So while we can't always control these social factors and we definitely can't control genetics, I believe we really should be focusing on what we can control and that is our behavior. How is thin privilege real when you work out and eat healthy and a fat person does not? Thin privilege is not about how much exercise a person does to maintain their physique. Also isn't the idea that thin people are not gonna get body shamed for being too small and therefore never experience body image issues or body shaming. I mean, we are all susceptible to that. It's simply an acknowledgement that having a socially accepted body affords you benefits, access, and less discrimination in a society that larger body folks just don't have. Like the idea that any clothing store is gonna carry my size, and an airline seat is always gonna fit my body, or even just equal access to employment or healthcare. I mean, there are all sorts of privileges in our life that we really should be reflecting on between white privilege and heterosexual privilege and gender privilege, etc. I'm not gonna push further on that, but I'm going to leave you with this amazing quote from Cora Harrington from Lingerie Addict. Uh, definitely check out her entire kind of tweet series on thin privilege, it's pretty much gold. Does health at every size mean you can gain as much weight as you want or lose as much weight as you want and be healthy? 
Not necessarily. So first I want to reiterate that the term is health at every size, not healthy at every size. I know it's subtle, but it's different. Second, the health at every size philosophy simply acknowledges that well-being and healthy behaviors are more important than the number on the scale. Linda Bacon's book is amazing. It's a great place to start. So I've linked that below, but basically there's five principles. The first of which is that no body weight should be pathologized. Well, I know a lot of you guys are probably thinking, well, what about somebody who's 70 pounds and anorexic or 500 pounds and bedridden? And to respond, I would quote Size Diversity and Health's website, which states, Hayes shifts the focus to acknowledging and respecting an individual's circumstances and works to investigate and support options that are available to help make choices that benefit health and well-being. In both of these circumstances, using a Hayes approach puts the focus on their behaviors, unique sets of abilities, and available resources, and places them in the context of their life as the primary areas of concern and consideration. The Hayes framework is based on research that suggests that weight loss diets just don't work. And through the restrict and binge cycle that we've talked about, they often can actually result in more weight gain. Hayes also points to research suggesting that yo-yo dieting and weight stigma, two experiences that are very common with people in larger bodies, can often explain health disparities. Finally, Hayes is grounded in the evidence that suggests that a person's body weight and size and shape is not a great predictor of their health. So for example, a 2012 study found that there were four behaviors associated with a reduced risk of mortality, including lots of fruits and vegetables in your diet, regular exercise, moderate alcohol intake, and reducing or quitting smoking none of which included specifically having to manipulate or change your body shape, size, or weight. These are behaviors that ultimately we can control. Furthermore, a series of randomized control trials found that a Hayes approach was better associated with improvements in blood lipids and blood pressure when compared with a weight loss treatment. So Hayes is not just about telling everybody, hey, just go be fat, but rather it's about shifting the focus away from the pursuit of being just one socially desired desirable body shape and size, and instead towards the pursuit of healthy behaviors like eating a well-balanced diet, physical activity, sleep, stress management, and intuitive eating, all while working together with your body's natural shape and size, regardless of where it falls on the scale. Are you a Hayes dietitian? I know this is controversial, so I will just say this. I am a Hayes supporter and a Hayes learner. I'm not a Hayes expert. You can check out my list of resources below for people who are way more versed than I am. And I too am really just trying to sort through all the research and evidence to make honest sense of it all. I do believe the research linking body weight to disease is flawed, correlation based, and therefore very difficult to tease apart from behaviors. I also think that the research supporting Hayes is promising and convincing to me that behaviors do play a large role. However, the research in Hayes is really in its infancy, so it's not extensive enough to be able to explain everything yet. What I know for sure is that the world would be better without dieting. We likely wouldn't see our body weight increasing way beyond our natural set point, AKA gaining a lot of weight. We wouldn't be obsessing over sugar and we wouldn't be feeling like we're addicted to food or shaming ourselves or others over our body or behaviors. We would probably be a much healthier society, both physically and emotionally. Everyone's journey is different and I'm not discounting that weight loss may or may not be part of that journey, but I just want to make sure that our next generation doesn't make the same mistakes that we have. I want to end this video by saying, I know that sometimes I'm a little bit harsh when it comes to calling out diet culture or YouTubers kind of gaps in their diet or their relationship with food. And because food is so emotional that I can sometimes offend people. I apologize for that. You should know that I believe it makes total sense that you want to lose weight. We live in a society that is completely obsessed with a specific body shape and size and being thin affords you so many luxuries in that environment. I admit that even I'm not immune to this. 
I have body insecurity thoughts all the time. But while I was on vacation, I was doing a lot of reading and podcast listening and ideating. And I want to emphasize that here at Abby's Kitchen, you are welcome. Everyone is welcome. You know, I was listening to an amazing podcast by Christy Harrison, who is the best. So check out her uh, podcast. I'm going to link to it below. But basically one thing she said was that even if you are anti-diet, it doesn't mean we are anti-dieter. In other words, you can sit with us. You're welcome if you're pursuing weight loss. You're welcome if you're vegan. You're welcome if you're paleo or keto, whatever. You do you. If you're eating in a way that feels good to you, then amazing. But unless you are a professional, keep your agenda to yourself. Further, the main reason why I call these things out so loudly on my channel here is not to undermine people's body autonomy, but only to actually change the overwhelming social pressure that we feel to police and alter our bodies. I need you to understand that it doesn't matter what your favorite YouTuber is doing. It doesn't matter what foods they're cutting out or how much or how little they're eating. That is not the only way to be healthy. Only you know what your body really needs. You don't need to change your body and really nobody should be telling you that you do. I'm gonna be diving into this in way more detail in my intuitive eating series, so stay tuned for that. But until then, I'm simply trying to dispel myths, denounce diet culture in general, and neutralize the language we use around food. So guys, I hope this answered a little bit of your questions, gave you a bit of a teaser. Please know that this is by no means extensive, so I highly recommend getting the intuitive eating book that I'm linking below. That will really get you started. Um, and if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Leave me a comment below what things that you want me to cover in the intuitive eating series. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.